Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're on to our um, last presenters, uh, and um, we, we would like to, uh, again, invite uh, those of you that are viewing the presentation in Second Life to uh, feel free to uh, ask questions. Um, now I'd like to welcome uh, Stacy Williams and Kyra Rothenberg, and they are going to present for us uh, virtual Immersion Center for Simulation Research. Thank you, Mace. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here today um, with my colleague, Dr. Kyra Rothenberg, to talk to you about the Virtual Immersion Center for Simulation Research. And what we're really talking about today is interactive virtual reality simulations. Oftentimes people say, well, what is that all about? And what we're really talking about is developing some type of immersive, interactive environment that provides a means for people both to visualize as well as interact with a variety of computer-generated artificial settings. Um, if you will, the holodeck, so to speak, is what we're really trying to recreate. So we can create a variety of settings and environments, both for our students here at Case Western Reserve University, as well as for patients that we treat in the medical setting. Why is that so important? It's important that we start to look at interactive virtual reality environments because they really replicate what we call a situated learning paradigm. And by being able to have a situated learning paradigm, it lets us get at the heart of something that Dr. Levgonik talked about today, which is deep learning. It's a practice-based approach. So we're able to put students in an environment or patients that's very dynamic, it's very interactive, and it's contextually based. Um, so they can actually get into a, a certain type of scenario or situation and use problem-based learning um, to really get through some of those issues that we're not really able to hit in a traditional um, classroom setting. It also um, promotes a community of learners, and that's really what we want to do is be able to learn from our peers um, as well as collaborate with others. Previous research has shown us that um, when we look at virtual reality training and the situated learning approach, it really improves the acquisition and retention of knowledge when you compare that to a traditional lecture. One of the key pieces when we look at situated learning is being able to um, evoke what we call presence. And really, it's the extent to which the user feels present in that type of artificial environment. And it's really critical that we have presence when we're trying to recreate these situated learning paradigms. Um, so that way, we can really bring out those feelings and the critical thinking pieces that need to go into that learning environment to really make it effective. In the area in which um, I specialize, which is communication disorders, we really have a need to try and create these immersive virtual reality environments. Because especially when we target our student training, we um, have increasing pressures to train our students to higher levels of competencies in a shorter amount of time. We're having to cover a variety of areas um, that oftentimes we can't give students the type of exposure to, um, to get them out of the class and into everyday situations where they can see things. For instance, in speech language pathology, it's getting them access to things like cleft palate, autism, um, all sometimes low incidence clinical populations that we just don't have quick access to. And we're having to show lots of videos and paper cases that oftentimes are not as effective as being able to give them a true ta training situation in that you know, particular type of setting or scenario as well as the fact that the types of patients that we see in communication disorders is starting to increase. And as you can see, I've put up some statistics behind me um, so you can see um, the prevalence of what's starting to happen in our field. Right now, it's estimated that one out of every 10 people in the United States will have some type of speech language or hearing disorder, um, as well as the amount of students that we're having to serve in the public schools, um, as well as we're seeing an aging population that's living longer that may need services in the future. So we need to be able to train these students more quickly and get them ready to go so we can get them out in the field to be well-trained clinicians. And also, I mean, we aren't just really talking just about communication disorders. We're also talking, if you look in the field of dentistry, medicine, we're all facing these same types of challenges with our students. So we really need to come up with an effective learning environment to meet these students' needs. 
So one of the ways in which we're trying to make this more effective is by creating the Virtual Immersion Center for Simulation Research. And really what we're targeting is what we call a cave-like learning environment, a place where I can put a student or a patient, again, where they feel immersed in this learning environment. And this is one of the um, solutions that we've come up to uh, for this problem with the help um, of Virtra Systems as well as ITAC and Media Vision and a variety of people here at Case Western Reserve. What we've designed is a 180 degree theater um, that as you can see there are films at play and the characters in these films actually interact with the students and clients when they come into this setting. We can change the scenes depending on the areas that we want to target. Um, the instructor station that you see um, behind or in front of those screens is actually how they're able to control the character's behaviors. So if a student is in this situation talking to a parent um, to want to get some type of case history because she's concerned that her child may have a suspected speech and language disorder, um, we're able to control the behaviors of that character by that instructor station. Kind of operates as we say like the Wizard of Oz. So what I'd like to do now is go ahead and play you a video clip to give you a better understanding um, of how this works. Case Western Reserve and the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center are experimenting with a virtual simulation lab modeled after the Star Trek holodeck. It may become the latest tool to help children with speech disorders communicate in the real world. Health anchor Monica Robbins takes us inside and shows us how it all works. It looks like a mini movie theater, but these screens are meant to simulate the real world. Can I have a cheeseburger and fries, please? Case junior Michael Molinaro is demonstrating how a speech disorder patient would interact with a McDonald's employee. Is it for here or to go? It's able to bridge the skills that they're receiving downstairs at the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center as well as with the outside world of what they live with every day. Project developer Dr. Stacy Williams is out of sight just a few feet away. She's controlling the actor's responses with a computer. Hi, welcome to McDonald's. Would you like to try a Big Mac? We can actually create any type of training situation at a touch of a button. The movies include everyday distractions, and each time can be a completely different experience. It's a safe environment. It allows them to practice, and they can do it over and over again. Participants wear biofeedback monitors, measuring heart rate and skin temperature. To be able to see if the patient is truly perceiving that learning environment as real. It can benefit students, too. Michael is studying to be a speech pathologist. The program can also put him into a scenario with a parent or patient. I think it's fantastic. It's a really amazing learning tool that we can use to become better speech pathologists. They're learning how to interact with people, how to ask important questions, how to gather information, think critically about it, come to a good decision or a diagnosis. Monica Robbins, Channel 3 News. And Dr. Williams is waiting on approval to allow children to begin using the lab. Students will start using it next month. The first set of clients will include those with stuttering problems and patients who use computerized communication devices. For more information on the lab, check out WKYC.com. Okay, so that gives you an idea, a good overview of um, how the center actually operates. Some of the research that we're preparing to, um, to get started with, um, the first, like I said, is as we start to target patients with speech and language disorders, the first set that we actually took a look at this summer were four patients with stuttering disorders, ranged in the age from 10 to 65. And really, um, what we wanted to focus on with that particular group was just to be able to compare their traditional therapy techniques to um, being able to receive therapy in the um, Vixer lab. So we wanted to see how real they perceived that environment, um, as well as to see how effective it was for carrying over their therapeutic techniques into um, an everyday setting. One of the challenges that we face in communication disorders when working with patients is in a clinical setting, oftentimes we can get a patient so far um, in their therapy, but the actual difficult part is carrying that therapy over into everyday settings. That's where we really see that patients struggle, and it's very difficult to simulate that type of exercise with a patient um, as a therapist. I can put on 
a hat for McDonald's, or I can try and role play and pull out a cash register um, so that I can try and get a client into role to really be able to work on those skills. But it's a very different um, feeling when you're actually in that type of setting, going to McDonald's and going through all of those things with all the different types of auditory and visual distractions that happen in that particular setting. So using the Vixer Lab, it enables us to give the auditory and the visual distractions um, and really bump up that realism factor so that we really can target that. And so that's what we're really anxious to see is how well that those skills would transfer over more effectively than a traditional approach that we have. That data is still currently being analyzed, um, but we're very optimistic at what that will show. We also know that patient feedback was very positive and that they enjoyed this type of setting and really felt um, that it was effective. And I'll let Dr. Rothenberg talk a little bit more about those results in a second. The other targeted research group that we're looking at, as well as I mentioned, are our students. I recently received a Presidential Research Initiative grant um, with Dr. Buckner, along with Dr. Lewis. And what we're looking for there is to be able to take our students in the Communication Disorders Program, as well as the medical students, and now the dental students will be participating, so that they will learn how to obtain good case history information from virtual patients. So now we'll be putting students in the um, Vixer lab as well, and they will be using it to target those types of skills. They're also able to administer diagnostic testing, and they're also able to counsel virtual families as well. So all of that interpersonal type of communication is something that we will be looking at in the future, and that study is currently ongoing. Um, at this time, I'll let Dr. Rothenberg come up and share some more of the um, results from the research that we have at this time. Hi, uh, we collected some preliminary research data and uh, the things that we were looking for were biofeedback, uh, presence, we had a survey for presence and motives, and then we were examining some of the outcomes. Again, this is very basic. We, we did some uh, preliminary research uh, and I'm just uh, giving you a, a rough idea of some of the things we've learned up to now. We identified motives to use. Uh, we started out by identifying from a simple survey before they entered uh, the IVR situation to see what kind of motivations that they might have. Well, they had some fears and they were excited about some things too. They thought it would be new, exciting, unique, and different, but they also thought it would be expensive. They thought they'd get extra homework, so there were some negative sides to it too. In addition to that, though, after we started collecting data and they were really using it, um, I'll begin with the biofeedback. We aborted it. Uh, we had a lot of trouble uh, collecting data on it. it was, we had trouble um, getting some uh, people signed up, adjusted to it. Uh, they were putting it on incorrectly. We were getting flat lines, and, and we just had to abort the whole thing. And so we're hoping to initiate this again soon. Uh, presence. Uh, they felt like it was real. We have some positive feedback associated with that. For motivations, motivations has to do with what gets people, what do they want out of this? What are their expectations when, it's, uh, when they're looking at motives to use the IVR? Um, fun uh, is a word that comes up a lot. Unique, something new. Um, also, they believe there's a perception. These are self-perceived um, ideas about the situation, they believe it's going to be more effective. That in itself can lead to some interesting outcomes. Um, they believe that they will be able to practice more in this near real safe environment. Um, we have self-reports that they will use it more and that it will be more exciting and more fun to use. For outcomes, um, outcomes, we have some very interesting things going on. It's expensive. Uh, patients did pay for this through Cleveland Hearing and Speech to use these, uh, the IVR environment. They paid for four. Uh, and this was paid through state money and various uh, other, um, I don't know, ways to, yeah, insurance programs. Uh, there were two additional ones that were offered to them. Of the four, all went through the six uh, experiences. That's really wonderful, and so we're really pleased with that. They, were, they weren't just asked, they asked to continue. And some of them are using it now that we're finished with the uh, research for this uh, preliminary um, examination. 
All right, so what are some of the outcomes? One is they wanted to continue. Um, another is they did find it fun and unique. Uh, they wanted to, um, they felt that they were more engaged in, in the therapy. And the people who were helping with this, uh, the therapists themselves and uh, some of our people that were helping with the technology, said that they loved it. Uh, they were encouraged to do it, more smiling, more positive um, uh, behaviors in it. Also, um, there were suggest uh, suggestions that people are practicing more, they're practicing more at home. And also, they are practicing more in a first life environment. So they're going to real McDonald's. And they are practicing and they're actually having fun going to real McDonald's. So we're seeing not only evidence that we can collect the motivations, we can examine presence at this time, but we are seeing an indication of real positive outcomes. Thank you. So oftentimes people um, ask, what are some of the limitations right now um, with this type of technology? Um, it's two years now, it's taken us to get up and running, and, and we're doing well. Um, but at this point, some of the limitations I'd have to say, or struggles we've had is, as we create a scenario, um, really what it requires is quite a bit of time, both in scripting, it's just like writing a movie, and trying to figure out all of the responses that we want to have our virtual um, patient, or or if we have a virtual McDonald's setting, the girl behind the counter be able to say. So these are not canned responses. Um, so as we prepare to write these scripts and then the filming process that goes on, it's a green screen process um, that we actually have to put an actor or actress in front of and then put the backdrops behind. Um, one of the ideas was, well, gee, at some point it would just be great if we could run in real time. So while we still would have the scripts at the same time, um, we'd just be able to run on the fly and capture from there. So that brings up the new possibilities now of investigating what we call digital puppeteer techniques. Um, that, as you know, with motion caption technology today, that we could go ahead um, and put a speech language pathologist in some type of suit, um, or you know, if it's going to be an instructor and just run in real time using 3D characters, and it would look something like this. Okay, we'll try this one more time. Why won't it show, do you know? It's okay. still not Is showing. It, uh, function F8. Okay. okay. Oh, but now I can't see from here, but that's okay. this recurring nightmare where I'm nothing more than a collection of reflective balls stuck on someone's face. So this kind of gives you an idea of real time um, with motion capture technology. Um, and we're starting to look into that as we speak. The nice part is as we can move to motion capture technology and running in real time, then we can be able to target smaller children. Most of our studies, as you heard, have targeted ages 10 and above. Now we start to ask questions about the preschool population and working with smaller children with speech and language disorders. This type of technology gives us the ability to be able to work with animated characters um, and again, run in real time. So it's very difficult when we try and predict what a small child might say. Also, we've started to look as well as using a new type of software system called iClone, um, which will actually automatically lip sync to the audio that we feed in. So once we have a script, if we can just get the audio recorded, we can use something like iClone that uses 3D characters. And at that point, they can go ahead um, and automatically lip sync that audio and become um, very real looking and lifelike. As you can see from this picture, we purchased the model, the girl on the right, her name is Masha than a blue t-shirt. And what we want to do now is make her look like a parent. So we, um, we have an animator that works with us, and so what she did um, was try and add some qualities or characteristics to her to give her more of a parent-like quality for a virtual patient. Um, and then from there, we fed in the audio. So I'm going to come back out and see if I can get the animation. In English to her as soon as we got her. Everyone speaks English to her now. And maybe that was the wrong thing to do. Maybe she was confused, and that's why she's not speaking more clearly. 
So really to put this in perspective, a filmed scenario roughly cost us $25,000 as we traveled to Hollywood um, to actually go ahead and start to create this content. Using um, a commercial package like iClone, um, once we purchased the 3D character, fed in the audio with um, very little, um, that there's not a lot of work needed to actually get her to animate at that point, fed in um, her audio, then we can create a patient now for around $1,000 um, and have her ready to go. So that's pretty significant for us in being able to continue to create lots of content that we need um, to generate for this lab so that we have a variety of settings. And finally, as we look forward to the future, one of the things that I think we'll start to look very closely on and more research is starting to come out now with is the use of um, androids or what we call human droids um, so that actually in the field of communication disorders that we can actually pair these talking robots with children so that they can go ahead um, and target their speech and language goals. And so David Hansen is actually starting to pioneer the way as he's being, he's able to create these types of robots that actually take on very real um, human characteristics and have artificial intelligence pr uh, programmed within so that they can respond. So let me see if we can bring this up. Okay, I won't even try. But anyway, if you go um, actually on the internet, look at David Hansen Robotics, you can bring up more about what he is doing. And I do feel in the future that this could be something that we'll see. I just recently saw a study that came out of Japan, I believe, talking robots for children with autism. So I do think, again, this is somewhere where we will be headed in the future as well. So at this time, I will open it up for questions. Any from Second Life? Um, not yet, but they are. Okay. So, you know what, I was looking down my, could you just play this one again? You, you want to see Mash again? I do. Okay. Yes, I will play that again. Yes. We started speaking English to her as soon as we got her. Everyone speaks English to her now, and maybe that was the wrong thing to do. Maybe she was confused, and that's why she's not speaking more clearly. And as you know, I mean, one of the biggest challenges we had with using the um, film was making it look natural, that morphing state, as we talked about, between going from the natural state, um, you know, branching off to a segment and coming back to natural. And the nice part about iClone um, is that that natural state is already built in. So she's constantly blinking her eyes and moving while she's in that natural state. And when she launches into a segment, it's really not detectable by the eye. Um, so that that's really one of was one of our biggest hurdles when it came to content. She actually looks smoother when she's smaller. She does look smoother when she's smaller. This she is does. the first time I've seen her this big. She's Get, blue her up. Can you try her on the big screens? Um, n no, actually not yet. We're that's actually planned for sometime later next week. Um, but like I said, we've had her on a big screen, just a mm, what. 40 inch maybe or so. That is just a demo for this presentation, but actually when you go into the um, theater-like system, um, she actually is head to toe. So she's in a full suit, you can see her feet, she's sitting in a, a chair. Okay, thank you.